probably the best place to start would be um, with some images of the Berlin that Franz Bieberkopf would have known. And the reason why I thought this is because um, there's this image, which we'll talk about a bit more later. There's this image of Berlin, which comes from like, you know, the musical cabaret or Berlin Babylon, or I hate to say awful things like that, which are not bad in their own terms, but it really is not the way Berlin looked or the way Berlin was in the 1920s. Um, so I, I want to give you a, a different image of Berlin um, than the one you might have uh, in your heads. Now, let me see. I am, oops, I have to find out how I, this is always a little complicated. Here we go. Can you see the Tegel Penitentiary 1904? Okay. Yeah. So this is where the novel begins. It's in the Northwest of Berlin. It's a, uh, for the time, modern penitentiary, modern jail. Um, built at the end of the 19th century. So he exits from this building. This is what it looked like on the inside um, in the 1930s, but it would have looked that way too when Bieberkopf was there. And then he takes a streetcar, which is for him very disoriented, into Berlin. Now, and he gets off here in the Rosenthaler Straße. Where are we located in Berlin? Well, actually this map, even though it's unified, is showing you two Berlins. There's the official Berlin. Here's the Reichstag. Here's the Brandenburg Gate, Unter den Linden, the Royal Palace, the Cathedral, the museums, and City Hall. And here's Alexanderplatz. Now, in actual fact, when I say there are two Berlins, is you have to imagine a line an invisible but very real line going around here. And what do I mean by that? To the west of it is official Berlin. To the east of it is working class Berlin. And believe me, people who worked and lived here would never cross over there. The people who inhabit the novel Berlin on the Alexanderplatz would never cross into here. And so it's there is no barrier, there's no Berlin Wall, but it's really two separate worlds. And this is the world we're gonna be looking at. So what's the world? Well, here is Alexanderplatz, uh, which in 1800 was really at the periphery of the city, but then with industrialization over a century, it expanded you know, far outwards. It was a major transportation hub. To the east of it, on the right of this map, this was all working class districts. And in fact, it's where Dublin grew up. Dublin was, well, he was born in Stettin, where his father had a textile um, store. But when his father was, when he was 10 years old, his father ran off with one of the employees to the United States. So his mom was stranded with five kids. Um, she moved to Berlin, where two of her brothers were, and they lived here in this working class area. After Dublin completed his medical studies and training in other parts of Germany, he returned here as well. So Dublin throughout the 1920s was actually a practicing medical doctor with a working class clientele just off the right side of this map. Now as I said, this was proletarian, you know, very solid working class. To the north of this map is also solid working class. Um, uh, Ida, the woman that Dublin was, work, was living with and, and whom he, he killed, and that's why he was in jail for four years, uh, lived just to the north of this map um, in the Akastrasse. Um, her sister Minna, who Franz, and one has to say, rapes at the beginning of the novel, she's living there too. So all of this around here is working class. Now, traditional working class. Now that's a little different for this area here. You've got, this is the so-called Scheunenviertel. And throughout the 19th century, it was very disreputable. It was where criminals hanged out. It's, you had a lot of prostitution there. When Franz, you know, first looks for a prostitute, it's here in the Elsasser Straße. And this is always a very dicey area throughout the 1920s. Then you've got this corner of the Scheunenviertel, and that was a Jewish quarter. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, with the beginning of the po massive pogroms in Russia, 
you had the first wave of Jews coming to Berlin and they settled there. Um, then after World War I, with, all of the, with the civil war in Russia, with the creation of Poland and the Baltic states, you had another wave of Jews and they settled there as well. Um, so it, it was very much a, um, uh, a, 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 you know, it was only a few blocks, but it was very thickly settled with East European Jews um, who had a very difficult life, especially in the fall of, in November of 1923. That was the height of the hyperinflation. And on November 5th and 6th, 1923, a mob actually attacked the Scheunenviertel and the police stood by for two days. I'm mentioning this because this Dublin, who did not have much of a Jewish self-identity, was profoundly shocked by what's known as the Scheunenviertel pogrom. After that, he started visiting the Scheunenviertel more and more. Uh, he also started attending Zionist meetings. And the next year, 1924, he went to Poland and he wrote a book called Journey in Poland. He looked at all the Jewish communities and he saw what was for him a totally new Judaism. Um, and, and that profoundly affected his, uh, his thinking. And that's, um, you know, the novel actually, you know, uh, let's see, where's my cursor? Uh, as I said, Franz Bieberkopf gets out on this street. He walks into the Sophienstrasse, but then he crosses back over and he ends up here in the Dragonerstrasse in an apartment of Jews. So that's, you know, that's where the, um, the novel begins. Um, just to give you some more visual images, um, this is the Scheunenviertel in the 1920s, those few blocks that I, I mentioned. Um, this is obviously a lending library. Um, here you have uh, a Hebrew bookstore, uh, as well as a butcher shop. It's called the Krakow Butcher Shop. Um, here's another picture, uh, the Krakow Cafe, uh, all within a few blocks of each other in the Scheunenviertel. And this is, as I said, where, um, where, where, where Franz Bieberkopf uh, first lands at the beginning of the novel. Um, as for the Alexanderplatz itself, going into the 1920s, it looked like this. You have the huge Wertheim department store. You've got a statue of Berolina. This is looking west. Here you can see the, um, the city hall. Um, a little further, you see the dome of the royal palace. What happens at the end of the 1920s, and you read about this in the novel, is this whole area is torn up. And it's torn up because a north-south subway line is being built. And it's opened at the end of December 1930. It's in three stories. It's arguably the most modern subway station in the world at that time. And then they proceed to redesign. By the mid-19, at the beginning of the 30s, you've got these two modern office buildings by Peter Behrens. Um, who is a you know, great modernist architect. And you also redesign uh, this chaotic traffic on the left with a real traffic circle on the right. So the um, Bieberkopf's Berlin is like the picture on the west, uh, on, the, on the left rather, but you have to imagine all of this being torn up. Now across the square from Wertheim department store is the police headquarters, which is also referred to in the novel, the great looming red brick police headquarters, which also served as an inner city jail. Here's a photograph of it, um, this massive structure in 1931. Moving quickly along, um, Bieberkopf sold newspapers. Uh, newspaper, there were about 150 daily newspapers in Berlin at the time. And uh, here you've got what the vendors looked like. There were vendors all over town. Competition was hard, so it was a rough job trying to, you know, bring your, uh, sell your newspapers to customers. And then I just want to briefly talk a bit about entertainment. You know, at the beginning of the novel, he um, sneaks into a cinema and he feels very happy there um, at first to be among people. You know, he sees it as, as, you know, very different from his time in jail. But when you think of, and this is where we start talking about what you might have as an image of 1920s Berlin and the reality of, of um, the Scheunenviertel and Bieberkopf's Berlin. You cannot, when he goes into a movie a cinema, it's not a fancy movie palace. It's a small cinema like this one here, which actually is in the Scheunenviertel in 1929. So you have to, you can have to imagine him going to a small theater like this two years earlier. In fact, it's called a Biograph Theater, which is so 
outdated by the 1920s. The first cinemas in the late 1890s were called Biograph Theater. And the fact that this one is still called that 30 years later just shows how outdated these institutions were, you know, unmodernized in the Scheunenviertel. Well, when he and his lady friend go out for entertainment, they go out to a place um, sort of to the pretty far to the south of here called the Volkspark Hasenheide, uh, an institution called Neue Welt, which was a big amusement park founded in 1880. And it, it had a lot of beer gardens. Um, it had other types of amusement as well. Liza Lohenberg. Uh, okay. Um, so it's, it has nothing, you know, if you have images of cabaret or things like that, that is not part of Franz Bieberkopf's world. Um, in fact, if you want to have images of um, Bieberkopf's Berlin, you have to forget the very famous paintings of George Gross or Otto Dix, who were definitely outstanding artists, but they are not depicting the world that Bieberkopf would have encountered. And that's why it's very wrong to have a George Gross picture on the cover of Berlin Alexanderplatz. I think a better artist to look at, who's not nearly as good artistically as Gross or Dix, is Hans Balucek. Here he has an image of um, the Volkspark Hasenheide, as I said, with Bibokop was. It's from 1895, but it wouldn't have been much different uh, 30 years later. Um, here are some other paintings that he gave to show you the sort of ambience that Bibokop would have been in. Uh, this painting is called Big City Lights. Uh, it's on a square about four blocks south of Alexanderplatz. It, of course, is ironical because, yes, you do have the neon lights here, but just look at the people. I mean, it's a gray existence. This is a working class, a lower class uh, crowd, which in the late afternoon, early evening, is walking through these streets. Um, uh, there's nothing fancy about this. Uh, uh, it's not your usual image of the 1920s. Or, you know, if, if you know the images of George Gross and Otto Dix of prostitutes, it's like they're always, you know, half naked with see-through clothes. Well, that never existed. Um, the, the image of prostitution, I mean, the reality was, of course, much more dismal. Here on the right, uh, Balochek is showing in 1929, again, the time of Berlin Alexanderplatz, uh, uh, women prostitutes congregating on a street corner. This is... Uh, the group that uh, Bieberkopf would have gone to in the Elsasser Straße at the beginning of the novel to look for a prostitute. And um, you get some image of the grimness here too on, in Balucek's uh, painting Morgengrauen. Morgengrauen is a standard word for um, daybreak or dawn. But this is a pun because Grauen also means horror. So you can also translate this as morning horror. I think that was clearly intended by Balochek. Um, before we, then the only other series of, of uh, so again, this is, think of Balochek when you think of, uh, uh, you can Google his paintings. Um, uh, Balochek is the painter of Bieberkopf's Berlin. He's the one to go to, I would recommend. Then the final thing I want to deal with is um, the slaughterhouse. I find one of the most uh, powerful passages in the first half of the novel, uh, his slaughterhouse chapter. This is to show you where it took place. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, um, the slaughterhouse actually used to be near the Alexanderplatz, but then it was moved further east into this huge industrial complex. Um, uh, here you see the inside of the um, stalls for pigs, or here the stalls for cattle and sheep. For the purposes of photographs, they are empty, but of course the reality was different. They were full of animals, as Bieberkopf, as, as uh, Dublin describes. Here you see pigs, masses of pigs getting unloaded, masses of cows in outdoor pens, and of course they end up, uh, as Dublin says in great detail, getting slaughtered. Um, as I said, this is for me one of the most powerful chapters of the novel. You know, I always say every year, um, if you read that chapter shortly before the beginning of Yom Kippur, you will have no trouble to not eat anything.